change that we're seeing in this world today is unprecedented in human history. So we are extraordinarily fortunate to be living in a time where our actions can make a real difference because of the access we have to the knowledge of generations past, but the power of compounding. Once we take the obsessive focus on shareholder wealth maximization away and look beyond, entire new fields are opening up. Hello, and welcome to season two of Conversations on Climate, the podcast series which has been developed in partnership with the London Business School's Alumni Energy Club, in which I've been leading a series of conversations with experts from around the world exploring the biggest challenge of our time, climate change. So today I'm very excited to be speaking to Professor Rajiv Sandhi, Academic Chair of the Wheeler Institute and Professor of Marketing here at London Business School. A world-leading academic who's received dozens of research and publications awards, Rajit is a skilled communicator with a deep knowledge of his fields that is second to none. A clear thinker, Rajit provides deep insights and strong conclusions, which makes us the conversation that you won't want to miss. Around 80% of people who listen to this podcast haven't hit the follow button. If we could ask you for a small favor, if you do enjoy our conversations, please do hit that follow button on your app. It would help us in the show more than I could possibly say. Thank you and enjoy the conversation. Professor Chandy, thank you so much for speaking to us today. It's a real honor, a real privilege uh, for you to come on in and uh, spend the time. Absolutely a delight. Thank you, Chris, for asking. Now, so um, you started out your career as an engineer, I believe. Yes. Yeah, and, um, and then you transitioned into marketing. That, that's, it's a pretty unusual step, step to take. How did, you, how, did, how did that come about? Well, I, I grew up in, in India where every uh, aspiring middle-class uh, family's uh, hope was that their son or daughter uh, would become either an engineer or uh, a doctor. It was pretty clear pretty quickly that I was going to be a terrible doctor. I realize now uh, I'd be especially bad uh, because I'm married to a doctor, I know what it takes. So there was the only hope the, uh, we had was for me to be an engineer to fulfill uh, our, the, the expectations. It turns out I was, a, not, I was not as bad as, uh, in engineering as in medicine, but I was not a great engineer either. But I found people fascinating. I still find uh, people endlessly fascinating, and especially people when they come together, the dynamics that happen, the uncertainty, the unpredictability, uh, uh, the nuances, I find fascinating. Engineering did give me the uh, sum, I think, uh, training in abstraction, which is a useful thing when you're an academic, uh, but uh, I'm afraid uh, uh, my departure from engineering was no loss for the engineering profession. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, it's an interesting way of uh, looking at the world. It's a very kind of nuts and bolts, practical way of looking at the world. Well, marketing is a bit more, you know, ethereal and, and you know, I guess creative, imaginative. Um, yeah, uh, how, how did you deal with the transition between uh, the two? So you see there are, uh, there are the poets, the creative, imaginative folks, and then there are the quants who would also consider themselves creative and imaginative. Uh, but there's the analytical side, which is increasingly huge in marketing. Uh, big data and, uh, and uh, AI and all of that technical stuff. So in many ways, uh, there's a whole bunch of engineers in marketing as well. But yes, uh, again, because we're dealing with uh, uh, understanding human psychology and uh, uh, trying to predict and understand human behavior, uh, that makes for much less predictable and more exciting, in my opinion, uh, world. Again, there's value to abstraction. There are patterns uh, that uh, one can detect uh, uh, as, uh, as academics. But in the world of marketing more generally, that combination of, uh, of uh, analytics, the right brain, left brain combination is part of the fun. So if we, we kind of dig a little bit into the, the marketing side, uh, you know, we'll, kind of, we'll unpack each of you know, yes. marketing, entrepreneurship and uh, developing worlds as we go along. Um, but in 2021, you wrote uh, Better Marketing for, for a Better World. 
Um, would you care to tell us a little bit about you know, your view of better marketing for a better world, what it means to you? Yeah, so it was a special issue that I co-edited um, with uh, colleagues from um, other universities, Chris Mormon, Geeta Johar, uh, and John Robert, uh, of the journal Marketing, which is our flagship uh, um, journal uh, in, in our field, academic field. And it was devoted to um, this topic of better marketing for a better world. I will, I'll come to what that means in a second, but I will say that although we brought together uh, the scholarly community for this special issue of the journal, this was a phenomenon that was bubbling, has been bubbling in our community for a while. Um, that special issue had the highest number of submissions ever for the journal uh, of all of the special issues uh, the journal has published. So there's something real happening in the community. To understand the impact of marketing in a manner that goes beyond the commercial. So um, too often, and indeed predominantly, um, academic researchers and the public at large too often has focused on marketing as something that um, A, uh, is targeted to commercial returns for a business entity. Now, there's a significant part of that. And by the way, when they say business entity, typically it's, it's a large company in a, in a uh, you know, people in suits in a, in a conference room coming up with uh, ideas. You've, you've seen yeah, Mad Men. Yeah, yeah, Don Draper. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but the reality of marketing um, is that a great deal of marketing and more and more of it is not only focused on uh, commercial outcomes, quite often it is, but uh, there is the opportunity uh, to actually make a difference in the world at large that in a way that goes beyond commercial profits for firms. So this special issue uh, was focused on, on the kinds of topics that would go beyond uh, commercial benefits. Everything from what is the impact of marketing on, uh, on the health of salespeople? You know, how does, how does Salesforce compensation affect uh, the physical and mental health of salespeople, for example? Yeah? Uh, two, how, does, how do you promote the adoption of new environmentally friendly um, fertilizers in China, in rural China? Uh, to a whole bunch of others, yeah? So we were just pleased as editors to see this outpouring of uh, uh, interest and enthusiasm. And now there are you know, entire conferences. I just came back from a conference we organized on sustainability and climate change to uh, the uh, theme of this podcast. So there's a great deal of uh, interest. Yeah, but uh, one of the points that came out was a survey which said that a majority of uh, marketers felt that, uh, that, th that these type of issues were important, like ESG issues, climate issues were, were important. But 80% said we weren't doing enough. Correct. Um, what's, what, what's holding the, the industry back? Yeah. Um, I think it's broadly institutional blindness uh, and uh, the uh, the fact that things take time to change. Um, you know, there's a famous uh, Hemingway line, uh, change happens uh, slowly, but then suddenly. It was sort of coming along and then it seems like things are happening rather quickly uh, now. Intellectually, philosophically, there was a strong emphasis on the primacy of shareholder value as the reason for being of businesses and indeed market activities more generally. And there's a lot to be said for, you know, why the profit motive is actually can be a good thing. But I think at this point, few people would argue you know, 20 years ago, people used to argue. At this point, even those in the city and beyond, uh, except for a small minority, are not like, uh, don't argue that that's the only thing uh, companies should be concerned about. In part because there's a recognition of, you know, uh, long-term returns. Uh, even if you're purely uh, focused on shareholder returns, you must be concerned about longer-term returns. Many shareholders are, and uh, 
and that requires you to think about the impact you're having, if nothing else, for purely cynical reasons uh, around you know, the impact on your brand, because you have a backlash, et cetera, et cetera. But I think that would be a, a disservice to the many in marketing who see marketing as a, a noble cause, uh, as a way of influencing uh, people uh, for the better. Uh, and influencing the world uh, in a manner that uh, creates progress and, and betterment and prosperity and, uh, and a better world, as our journal put it. Um, just to push back a little bit yeah, on, on that, um, if we can look at marketing in a climate context, at least until relatively recent days, uh, the association hasn't been very positive. Yeah. It's been it's been greenwashing. It's yeah. been climate denial. It's been um, the trying to influencing of uh, mainstream media to to, to 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 get negative messaging about. Even if you have a look at um, carbon footprint, yeah. you know that's that is something that was that was a construct of of, yeah. of BP uh, to try and kind of take the responsibility from 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 BP and put it onto individuals. Why do you think that they that marketing has been so effective, and it was effective for an awful long time, at um, pushing these other interests? That's a great question. Um, large companies have large resources, and uh, leaders in some large companies see it fit for their objectives um, to try and influence the world that way. But again, I think it would be a mistake to see that as being marketing in its fullest sense. I think the mistake we make is in assuming that, um, that marketing comes from the big companies. So think about climate change and its effects. By the way, climate change is also a construct of, of a marketing department, that, that particular phraseology, because it, it sounds relatively non-offensive. So if you're talking about you know, the climate emergency, like that's something that you think, oh, I need to do something about. See, but climate change is gentle, and that it came from, from a, a, a notable think tank in the US. Uh, so you're absolutely right. These words matter, framing matters, um, um, how, we th uh, how we communicate things uh, matter, what we're selling matters, absolutely. Yeah? But what I, uh, the point I'm making is, think about the effects of what's happening, let's call it climate emergency, um, um, on the world. Some of it is um, farmers losing their crops. A farmer who then says, I need to think of drought resistant varieties of, of a crop or change my crop entirely, is engaged in Marketing in the sense that the product he or she is engaged in is, is changing. Yeah? That farmer who sells to a new market, yeah, so going from a, a certain crop to a different crop, is engaging in marketing, engaging with intermediaries who are engaged in marketing. Greta Thunberg and those huge uh, campaigns, uh, genius campaigns, uh, to wake up the world, uh, another form of marketing. We have to recognize these many dimensions uh, of, of marketing and we cannot let the, the large corporations necessarily all, uh, for some that may be good and others that may be less than good, uh, monopolize uh, that phrase, shall we say, that the brand of marketing. You mentioned a little earlier um, that Financial asymmetry, mm. yeah, and something in the in the, you know, the climate space. There's historically been a very very uh, strong imbalance between the uh, people who don't want climate action, who've been very well funded, and then you know, smaller pockets of, of individuals who, who who do. What strategies have you seen that might have been successful? Of if you don't have enough, you don't have the same money as the other guy. Yeah. How can you still you know put, punch above your? Yeah, own? if I had to summarize it, it would be. We have to think of ways in which to harness the winds of change. It's not the resources we have. Now, those resources are huge. Uh, in, you know, many years ago, I studied the role of incumbent companies um, in, in driving change and innovation. I am in awe of the resources they could bring to bear. 
Sometimes those resources are wasted, but very often they are applied to effective ends. Yeah? So the only way, the, if you do the David versus Goliath story, the David can you know, go up against the Goliath is by perceiving and harnessing um, resources that are greater, forces that are greater than themselves. The social, political, environmental trends that are associated with climate change slash emergency slash uh, um, action are huge. And they're so diffused now that uh, my belief is uh, enough money will go in, is going in. And now you see what the government, U.S. Uh, uh, government is doing uh, with you know all the green initiatives there. Um, so it, it, it is so harness those uh, energies and and resources that exist beyond you. Um, and another key key part, key part of your work, uh, which you know, very very neatly um, led into uh, from from the last examples you gave, is innovation. And innovation is somewhere that is something that is, of course, going to be absolutely vital if we're going to be kind of working through the various issues in, in climate. Um, but innovation, it's a big concept. Um, would you care to kind of like un unpack the, the elements of it? Yeah. So I, I should distinguish between innovation with a capital I, or the radical innovations that change the world, and uh, which tend to be f uh, infrequent. You know, there's this wonderful phrase by Stephen Jay Gould, um, about the nature of evolution, uh, and it's along the lines of uh, the story of evolution is uh, long periods of boredom punctuated by a few moments of sheer terror. Um, that's really how evolution works. That's really how innovation works as well. It's lots of incremental changes, many of which are only new in the innovative novel sense. Um, to an individual, a company, a context, followed by a few, you know, world-changing kinds of uh, innovation. What is innovation? The classic definition uh, is a novel idea applied to a useful end. So the novelty is important, but so is the application. It could be commercial application, it could be social application, something else. So it's not a, an idea per se, it's not even an invention, a uh, uh, some, uh, product that's sitting on someone's shelves, um, but it's an actual application. And uh, so if you think about climate and, and all of the uh, innovations that are a bit part of it, well, you know, if as and when nuclear fusion eventually makes it to empower us all, uh, that might be a giant uh, capital, huge mega I um, uh, innovation. But the rapid reduction in costs of solar panels and the business models that allow solar panels to be distributed to millions of homes all around the world and indeed power entire um, cities in some cases. <clears throat> uh, those innovations, some of which are, um, um, uh, are in cost uh, reduction related innovations, some of which are in tiny incremental uh, process product uh, uh, innovations, are just as important. And uh, there's a role for several uh, forms of innovators, uh, therefore, as well. Um, but what are the ingredients of successful innovation? At the, let's just talk about the firm level first. Yeah. And this is relevant as, as so many companies are trying to change their means and so on, uh, how they approach the, um, their, their businesses and what they should be doing, what their purpose is and so on. Uh, some colleagues and I studied this for close to 20 years. and. Of course, we're not the first to study uh, innovation. There are many others who've, uh, who've done so. Uh, so we, look, we said, let's review the literature on innovation, innovation and look at all of the factors that have been hypothesized as being the drivers of innovation, some of which have to do with you know, where you're located in the context of 
uh, global warming and so on, uh, there's a belief that the colder parts of the world are more innovative. Um, there's a whole book on this. Um, the farther you go from the equator, uh, it's not just linear, it's, it's a squared thing. So the distance between Italy and Norway, uh, the level of innovativeness that that leads to by going to Norway is even greater than the difference between you know, Italy and Cairo or something like that. Yeah? So there's that. Or mm, some argue it's about investment. Lately especially, there's been a resurgence of belief in the power of governments to, to create this bonanza of innovation. Uh, some argue it's about company level investment. So there's been concern about, for instance, in Britain, uh, the percentage of uh, sales that are spent on R&D among companies in this country versus in other countries. So, we looked at a whole bunch of such dimensions. Um, patents, you know, et cetera, et cetera. By far the factor that matters, there's like 200 odd factors, you know, everything from religion you know, to everything else. Um, by far the factor that mattered was one that existed within the company. And that is what we call the culture that exists within the company. Not national culture, not you know, Norwegian culture versus you know, British culture or Indian culture or something, uh, but rather the culture that exists within companies, at least for moments, in some cases decades, uh, but certainly for moments. Um, and these are driven by the people at the top. Okay. These are shaped by the people at the top. Uh, and these relate to the point about um, climate change because by far the top thing that mattered within culture had to do with the extent to which senior managers in the company focused on markets of the future relative to current and past markets. The more they focused on markets of the future relative to current and past markets, the more innovative their companies were. Um, and, and associated with that were other dimensions, but culture seems to matter. And so the enemy or the angel is within rather than in the context you're in. So, you know, we may be worried about the state of British industry today, but honestly, we should be looking within companies rather than British industry as some aggregate concept. Okay, so that sounds like um, a top-down structure, and if you're, if you're, if the leadership, the CEO, is someone who is embracing looking, looking forward, um, that uh, that drives the rest of the organisation forward. But where's the role of of kind of bottom up? Because um, yeah. there's there's a lot of, particularly on the climate side, um, a lot of and you know, the mass the mass resignation, all these all these kind of social factors where where, where the, these are more and more important to to, to, to people going into the workforce, as uh, ESG factors, environmental factors. How can that feed up to make uh, a a business innovative in the in in the climate sense? It's a it's a great question. Certainly, individuals other than those at the top matter. And in our research, we found people we call uh, champions of innovation. Uh, so these are the people who are particularly passionate. I'm sure you've met these individuals. Uh, you may be one of them, uh, uh, Chris, uh, um, who are passionate about a topic, um, almost stubborn, many would say, are deeply uh, entrenched themselves and can see a vision of the future that too many up in the top don't see or around them don't see. Well, we found people who meet the personality dimensions of these uh, champions uh, in companies that were innovative and not innovative. So these were people who were outgoing, these were um, uh, persistent uh, individuals. You found these people in both kinds of companies. The difference was in the innovative companies, the, there were incentives and there were um, uh, the, the, these champions um, had influence. Either because they could, there were other kindred spirits within the organization they could come up with, either because top management supported these kinds of things, um, um, or because they were able to create uh, and harness enough resources within. But it, 
sadly, those individuals existed in the non-innovative companies too. But when we went and interviewed them, much of the time was spent as if we were like psychotherapists for them. Yeah? Uh, they were complaining about the very people who sent us to them to talk to them because they were supposedly the, uh, the champions. So the mass resignation is at least partly includes those individuals who you as a company, in order for you to be innovative, desperately need to remain. But somehow you have not created the environment. You have not created um, a, a sense of purpose and direction uh, uh, and the set of incentives that would keep them with you. Okay, well, why don't we talk about um, one of, the, one of the, the contextual issues I was thinking about was uh, the incumbent's curse mm. and how uh, the, the, the difficulties that an incumbent will have in, in innovating. Would you like to talk about Okay. That? Actually, this is part of my PhD um, research uh, many years ago. Uh, a paper that we published, uh, one of my more cited papers, is called The Incumbent's Curse in Radical Innovation. And it's an incumbent's, cu incumbent's curse question mark because there's this belief that major innovations tend to come from outside uh, an industry. It's the outsiders, the David versus Goliath story. These small outsider, upstart, um, you know, being able to see what these giants uh, were not able to see. And what we find is in industry after industry that we analyzed is that actually if you look at the most radical innovations, objectively defined a priori, and, say, and look at the source, not of the invention, not of the idea, but the commercial application or the social application of the innovation. By far, especially in recent years, by far most of them came, to, came from the very large firms that we love to hate. <laughs> Why? Uh, one is just money. Yeah. Innovation, increasingly, especially innovation with a capital I, is expensive. Money can buy you people, money can buy you equipment, money can buy, and not only that, the large companies have the ability to borrow money at cheaper rates than many others. Yeah? So resources uh, are important that incumbents and large firms have. The second is, and we saw a pattern over time, many incumbents have a paranoid streak to them because they have seen others like them fall, or indeed in some cases, they were the cause of the demise of others who they have come to look like. But if scale is such a benefit, um, how do you explain the, you know, the IPO slump? Uh, so you're referring to a, a paper we published recently. Um, Chris, first of all, I'm so impressed. Uh, I wish more people uh, would, uh, would read my, I think you're probably the most closest uh, reader of my work that uh, I've ever encountered, I must say. <laughs> so we published a paper recently uh, about uh, this idea that uh, uh, called the IPO, post-IPO innovation slump. Uh, what does this mean? There's this tendency, which has been documented again and again, that private companies, after they uh, go public, see a pronounced slump in their innovation outcomes. Uh, and we said, why is that? Well, once again, related to our incumbency story, it's useful to look at the exceptions to the rule. It turns out about a third of all IPOs in the sectors we study um, uh, in, uh, about two thirds involve the slump in innovation. So if you're a, uh, if you just buy shares in an IPO, odds are uh, that two thirds of those, you know, in a widely distributed uh, um, uh, portfolio will go, uh, will not be very innovative. But a third were. And we said, what's different about these? Once again, I would point, we point to the early what we call imprinting that happened much before they went public. And that imprinting, which 
again owes itself uh, to the leaders and the processes and the systems uh, that they created early on in the company. The direction, the role models, the incentives that they created early on, that seems to persist even after the IPO. So if you have imprinted innovation into your DNA, if you will, early on, then the company remains innovative even after you go uh, IPO. But if you were wavering about it beforehand, uh, then odds are the pressures you will face for short-term results will cause you to sacrifice the long-term investments you need to make in it. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So where do you see the future of green innovation primarily coming from? Is it from the larger firms or from startups? My short answer would be let a thousand flowers bloom. Yeah? Um, I think some of the larger firms will become irrelevant. Um, others will become even more powerful than they are now. Um, some of the smaller firms of today will become giants. Most others will either die or in some cases be acquired. Any process of industry evolution involves this, this uncertain period where everybody's sniffing opportunity and it feels that way these days, you know. Every other alum I meet uh, from our MBA seems to be involved in um, something called uh, ground truth verification, uh, um, where you know, you're verifying what is actually happening on the ground when it comes to climate uh, initiatives. Uh, everybody's sniffing opportunity here. Yeah? And there's an air of uh, excitement uh, in, in the environment. But over time, you know, um, many are called, but a few are chosen. Uh, a few will manage to bring together the resources uh, that are necessary to achieve scale. And the others will either disappear, they will shut up shop and go work for the large companies, uh, the newly large or the existing large, or um, others will uh, um, be acquired and uh, do their own thing. And, mm -hmm you know, give lectures on uh, entrepreneurship after. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, yeah, one thing I've noticed over recent years is uh, the evolution of people who are in this industry. Mm. Uh, I'm sure you've seen, seen it in your classroom and actually in these doing interviews with, uh, with alumni. Uh, the older alumni I speak to uh, tend to be people who got into the industry because they really, really believed in it mm. and they thought it was really important. The younger people, they seem to be in it because they think it's a great opportunity. And the climate stuff, oh, that's, that's nice, you know, it's good. But they don't, they're not as, they're, they're not the kind of, the true believers from generations past. Personally, I think it's a really good thing. It's a very positive, positive development where people see it as an opportunity because we need as many, you know, peep, as many you know, troops on the ground as, as you can get. And whatever your motivations are, if you're still working on it, that's, that's, that's a good thing to my mind. But have you noticed that that's kind of, progression in, in your, your experience in your classrooms? Yes, yeah, so I taught my first MBA class in 1996. Uh, first ever class in 1995, so almost 30 years ago. Um, I see parts of what you're describing in that you did have to be a true believer in the past, almost by definition, right? You were going against the grain, you were uh, you know, you were seeing something that others failed to see or didn't care about. That's worse, you know, just uh, indifferent. Actively opposing at least energizes you. Indifference deflates you, yeah? So you had to be a true believer. <clears throat> what I do see that's slightly different from what you described is a sense of idealism that seems to pervade this current group. You know, our social impact club on campus was a niche club before. And now it's a whole week of activities that continues throughout the year, right? And so the, around campus, there's a sense of excitement around all things related to this. So one really important thing to talk about on the subject of innovation is uh, not all innovation is necessarily good or positive. Going back to uh, kind of pre-financial crisis, um, there's a lot of financial instruments that 
really we shouldn't have done because it caused an awful lot of pain. And um, in the kind of climate sense, well, it was really a good idea to be figuring out how to be, you know, fracking shale gas. It's it's you know, arguably, you know, for, certainly for a carbon point of view, not. How do you protect against you know the dark sides of innovation? Yeah, uh, it's a great question. Uh, I will say on the on the fracking etc. stuff. I moved to the United States in 1990, and. Uh, at that point, the great worry was uh, the United States' energy dependence on, you know, all kinds of uh, uh, nefarious actors around the world. Uh, um, and in many parts of the, world, in, of the United States, certainly, that's seen as a, on balance, you know, uh, not a, a, a horrible thing uh, that, uh, uh, there are many dark sides, so it's a complicated uh, thing. Uh, the reason we don't hear as much about uh, the dark side is where well, there's an understandable reluctance to engage in moralizing without knowing enough yeah, uh, about complex things. That's where independent, objective, um, rigorous uh, investigation, whether through academic researchers, whether through journalists, whether through courts, whether through um, regulators and uh, law enforcement, is important because we have to a define the dark side and and call out those that are in so many cases, unambiguously dark, yeah? It's not just, uh, uh, it's not just a matter of, uh, of uh, on the one hand, on the other hand, yeah? Too often it's unambiguously dark and it's still not uh, dealt with. And so there is an aspect of self-policing, uh, but we need healthy skeptics. Um, we need uh, objective researchers. I must say, one of the points we make in our editorial about uh, a bus better business for a better world is too often as business school academics, we have shied away from calling out the dark side. You know, could be an employer, who knows? Yeah. Or we feel like, oh, that's too controversial. Yeah, let's not. Um, in fact, in our uh, editorial, uh, there was a debate in our team, in our author team, should we name names? Uh, and in the end, we said we must because um, you know, we, we, we as independent academics can't name names on topics where it's objectively determined uh, by you know, practically everybody that this company, which is a uh, you know, well-known company, uh, is doing bad things. We must name names. Um, so I would say yes, um, companies themselves should recognize those dark sides. Whether for the greater good of the world or for the greater good of their long-term shareholders, um, they should recognize, but in the absence of that, um, we need independent voices, we need objective voices, and, uh, and they can't just be uh, advocacy groups. Uh, and we certainly as business schools uh, uh, cannot be advocacy groups uh, for uh, those engaging in those dark side practices, mm -hmm. uh, just because they happen to be wealthy or powerful or resource rich uh, mm -hmm. at this time. Yeah, that's kind of the point of tenure, isn't it? <laughs> you, yeah, can, exactly. you, can, you can say what you want. Yeah, Precisely. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but freedom. the reality is too often we're reluctant to. Um, why? Because oh, they have law lawyers. Uh, uh, who's going to pay for our lawyers? Uh, and uh, they'll, uh, do you want to get involved in this sort of, you know, tricky business? Uh, we must have the courage and our institutions should support researchers who have the courage to stand up, 
whether it's as, a, as an academic institution, uh, with or without tenure, um, whether as a journalistic institution, whether as a, as a uh, legal institution, whether government and governmental institution, we must stand up to that. Mm. Okay, so moving along to the, the final kind of you know, segment uh, of the, the conversation, um, uh, you work on uh, developing markets. And uh, we talked uh, off camera briefly about the, uh, you know, the differences between um, entrepreneurship um, in developing markets and, and here. Now, I think one thing in the climate space uh, we're quite guilty of, we, we do talk a lot about um, the, the developing world, but it's generally in terms of climate justice and how, and how, how unjust the, the situation is. And we don't really focus on the developing world as um, you know, sources of hope and sources of, of innovation. Um, and it's something that you've, you, you've, you've cons considered uh, quite, quite a lot. Would you care to kind of elaborate yeah. on? Yeah. So, uh, I was recently in my hometown, uh, Cochin, India. And uh, when you uh, land in Cochin, India, you see this giant um, wall that says, the world's first 100% solar powered airport. Yeah? And when you look outside, it's like this Mass, you know, all airports have large amounts of land uh, for various reasons, I suppose. Uh, but much of the land in Cochin Air International Airport is covered by solar farms. The greatest needs when it comes to these matters uh, also exist um, in developing countries. It's one thing for us to be talking about climate change sitting here in freezing London, or indeed whether or not it'll snow tomorrow, um, or whether the summer will be hotter than usual, whether we'll need to buy air conditioners or whatever. It's another to be living, literally choking, in pollution, um, where you know your child's life expectancy is going down literally every time he or she steps out of the, uh, of the door. So these are not nice to have, or if we don't do it today, bad things will happen 20 years or 50 years from now. These are present and very real uh, issues that are being confronted there. And we as humans, deal with problems, we're come, trying to come up, come up with solutions. Some that, some that require resources, and as, uh, as developing countries have become wealthier, they've managed to uh, cobble together more resources. But some that require ingenious uh, ways of using existing technology resources to do new things, what we call leapfrogging where you take you know, solar panels that were not invented in Kenya, um, but apply those in an ingenious way that allows pay-as-you-go solar in a distributed manner, which is like stuff of you know, dreams. So the biggest challenges facing the world actually, when it comes to climate change, actually exist uh, today in developing countries. And so it's not surprising that some of the most exciting innovations are coming out of there as well. Um, that includes innovations um, that by large companies and government entities that are trying to solve those issues. Um, so the International Solar Association Federation, which is a grouping of well, over 100 odd countries, uh, is headquartered in New Delhi. Uh, why? There's, these are the sunshine countries, you know, where actually have sunshine, unlike sometimes uh, uh, where we live here in London. Um, and the needs are the greatest. And, um, and so I have uh, great hope uh, in the developing world, not just being, you know, an object of our sympathy, but the source of our inspiration. Mm -hmm. And that's already happening. And uh, the concept of, kind of leapfrogging is, kind of, is quite related to the concept of um, uh, compressed uh, yeah. change. Yeah. Yeah. How, how, how the two. So, this is a, a concept uh, 
the idea of compressed change uh, is one that uh, my colleague Om Narasimhan and I proposed a few years ago. So imagine uh, you're a consumer here in London and uh, you are banking in its current form, form of banking arrived 100 odd years ago or more. Electricity arrived 100 odd years ago. Uh, telephones arrived. Now, imagine the life of a Kenyan villager. Highways arrived in the last 10 years. Electricity arrived in the last few years. Um, telephones arrived. Uh, all of these miraculous things, like almost like magic things, arrived all in the space of one compressed period. So things that happen over a long period are actually happening in developing countries in a very short period. You alluded to the power of compounding. That, that the integration of all of these things, and the possibilities of um, what's called, in rather academic jargon, recombinant innovation, which is you're combining all these trajectories together to create something new. Um, that exists in a manner um, that has never been seen before, ever. Uh, this level of compressed change has never been seen, uh, ever. So this gives great hope uh, for new businesses, new products, new business models, uh, and indeed new ways of living, uh, which we're seeing. And it's all driven by the fact that profoundly important needs uh, remain unfulfilled uh, in these places. And increasingly, people are demanding uh, through their wallets uh, or through their voices um, change uh, to add that fulfills those needs. Mm. And it's also em empowering you know, masses, massive amounts of people whose voices couldn't have been heard you know, not so long ago. Correct. And, and they could be, you know, the Chinese electric industry, electric car industry is powerful uh, and arguably the largest today for a bunch of reasons, including the fact that China was, until recently, and in some ways still, suffering some of the worst effects of uh, air pollution uh, and uh, water pollution in the world. They have the most intense needs. It's not an abstract concept. The same applies in India, in Africa, and other places. But they have, those needs are very palpable today. And you've done a lot of work, um, you're mentioning, in um South Africa, you know, doing these these international experiences, part of the part, part of the program here, um, and you do a lot of work with with uh, micro entrepreneurs. Um, what sets micro entrepreneurs apart? Well, uh, a micro entrepreneur is uh, any business we define as classic definition is any business with very few employees. So it could be self-employed or less than five employees is a, is a famous definition. Oh, well, the micro entrepreneur is the most common business person on earth. The, most, the archetypical business person is not someone sitting in a suit in a high-rise building. The archetypical business person is someone sitting in, in a market somewhere in the developing country. In a developing country selling, trying to eke out a living. Their lives are not glamorous. And most are doomed to life as permanent micro-entrepreneurs. Growth is an elusive thing. Now, much of the world in, involved micro-entrepreneurship. And in many ways, large corporations that we tend to study in, in, uh, in business schools are extraordinarily rare and remarkable creatures. It's, it's mind-boggling to imagine. Every time in a, I'm in a board meeting, I'm looking at uh, uh, P&L statements and an entire company coming together and analyzing this and understanding the implications. That level of abstraction is genius. It's also rare. Now, there exist opportunities um, for us 
if we want to make a difference in the lives uh, of many and fulfilling aspirations of so many around the world, one of the greatest things we could do is to improve their lives uh, and their livelihoods. Uh, and in the process, they will improve their lives. So, um, so micro-entrepreneurs uh, have challenges with access to information, access to money, access to uh, skills, uh, access to the rule of law, for example, and norms. Uh, all of these could be improved, and that would lead to fewer firms. Again, the United States has 6.5% self-employed. Tanzania has 85%, uh, South Sudan even higher. The reality is the poorest parts of the world also tend to be the most entrepreneurial. But also entrepreneurial in a way that does not become more formal, does not become um, uh, employers. And there exist opportunities to change that. And that change is happening. As countries get wealthier, they tend to have more medium of the SME, and M of the uh, SMEs goes up, uh, and that's a healthy thing. Uh, for a long time, you've been a champion of the power of like big data to, to try and understand um, the you know, de developing developing markets, developing worlds. What does kind of big data for good mean mean in in this context? How can we be using it to be improving these? Yeah. Uh, some colleagues and I wrote a paper on, uh, on using big data uh, to do good. And we focused on, in, in, on emerging markets. And uh, uh, we used this Woody Allen joke uh, about these two women in upstate New York complaining about the, the food being served at the resort they were staying in. And one says, um, you know, the food at this place is terrible. And the other says, and such small portions. Uh, so, uh, the reality of data in, in uh, emerging markets used to be that. The quality of the data was terrible and such small portions, we had so little data. Yeah? And so we were making big uh, decisions based on very poor data. And the diffusion of tele telecommunications, the diffusion of uh, mobile money, the diffusion indeed of uh, identity systems around the world, for example, have led to a transformation in, uh, in what is possible um, to do good. So we use the examples of the earthquake in um, you know, various places nowadays where you can see movement of people, migration from those locations, and in some cases, the, in Haiti, for instance, the last time they had an earthquake, the, the, the uh, movement of cholera, for instance, uh, through the movement of SIM cards. One of the greatest things people can do um, for migration in particular is give people an identity. And, and that data becomes crucial to what you're able to do uh, uh, and what you're not. And so uh, the point of the, uh, that we make there uh, is that we're going from a, a, a period of emerging markets being the source of very little data to being extraordinarily rich in data in a way that, for instance, the United States is very reluctant to provide ID you know, in a unified database. Well, that's happening around the world. Uh, the Indian uh, national ID system is being, there's like a succession of uh, policymakers from around the world trooping into India to see what they're doing with their national ID system because of the, uh, the data possibilities it offers. Whether, so we saw, we saw this with COVID. How do you target um, uh, aid and relief to affected communities with the, during the lockdowns, uh, to those who are particularly um, in need of those. And the more you know, climate emergencies we have, the more relevant this becomes. Uh, data allows us the possibility to do that. Well, um, I think we've just got one last question, and it's a, a kind of common theme of what we you know, ask, at, ask at the end. It's uh, kind of advice for, for the next generation. Um, so from 
Someone who's sitting in your chair who advises um, entrepreneurs and uh, people who wish to go into kind of marketing and um, innovation. Um, you're someone who has got a strong belief in wanting to improve, uh, wanting to want to improve improve the world, and particularly improve the fields that you work in, and you know, and, and advise and try and try and nudge, nudge them in in the right direction. Um, what advice would you give to people, to, to young people, either on the academic side or into entrepreneurship, about how they can be similarly kind of improving, moving the fields that they're in um, in the right direction? Yeah. Um, uh, great question, and it's a sure side of age when you're asked to provide advice to the next generation. Um, Call it expertise. <laughs> <laughs> Wisdom. Wisdom. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. No. Uh, I would say the, the change that we're seeing in this world today is unprecedented in human history. And this is a, I could go on for three hours on why. So we are extraordinarily fortunate to be living in a time where our actions can make a real difference. Because of the access we have to the knowledge of generations past, but the power of compounding. And this means that each of us has this extraordinarily, extraordinary, unprecedented opportunity to make a difference. You know, um, the, the vision of the London Business School, uh, one of the reasons you know, I'm particularly drawn to this place is to have a profound impact. And I think that's not unique as a, an aspiration uh, to London Business School. We could each have a profound impact. Now, if you're an academic, there are entire new fields opening up. Once we take the obsessive focus on shareholder wealth maximization away and look beyond, entire new fields are opening up. Yeah? This did not exist for generations. Similarly, if you're an entrepreneur or uh, a business person, there, there are entirely new ways being conjured up now of the ways in which we could make a difference. And that is hugely satisfying. And we, so we have the ability, we have the opportunity what we need is the motivation. So the advice I would have is keep that motivation. Don't let obstacles make you a cynic or a pessimist. The good news is you don't have to be one of those lonely voices anymore. There are many more like you uh, who also are equally motivated also are able to offer their abilities and point us to those opportunities. Explore. Yeah. Look beyond your own context. Uh, and you might see that suddenly things come together and all of us can make a difference. So that would be my advice, to so maintain that motivation and maintain that desire for a profound impact. Right. Thank you very much. That was an absolute, absolute joy. Such a delight, Chris. Thank you. Well, thank you very much for uh, joining us on that conversation. Uh, we hope that you enjoyed it. Uh, we hope that you uh, learned something. Uh, if you did enjoy it, please feel free to leave a five-star review and uh, to subscribe to, uh, to any of our channels. And uh, we'll be sure to keep you updated on future productions. This series is produced by United Renewables in collaboration with the London Business School Alumni Energy Club.